I've been, you know, we finished, Stacy and I finished our, our binge watching of Bones a couple weeks ago, and we've been struggling on what to, what to watch together. We're like, man, nothing's just piquing our interest. But we have this one, I guess it's a guilty pleasure. Anybody ever watch the show Hoarders? <laughs> Look, if you've never seen it, don't. Because once you've seen it, you can't get away from it. Because there's, uh, I'll be honest, there's a part of me that is just so thankful that I have Jesus and I have been set free and I don't have that kind of bondage in my life. But then there's another part of me that watches and listens to the stories of these people. And I'm like, my goodness. Because I'll, I'll tell you that, that uh, uh, fresh off of watching an, uh, an episode of it last night, a, a lady who uh, had been married for many, many years and her husband got sick and died. Uh, and she just began to buy online. And then never opened the boxes. And her house was filled with unopened Amazon orders. And just stuff. And she knew that this was not right. I mean, it's, it's good when they're admitting, this is not right. But she just, she sat in it. She sat in filth. I'll be honest, her, her kitchen was disgusting and... You don't eat dinner when you're watching Hoarders, because it'll make you not want to eat. But, man, she, and she kept talking about loss, about this loss in her life. She kept talking about this, this lack, this void that is in her life. And what she had, it, it's interesting that she chose the inanimate to fill the void left by a person. She chose the inanimate. And, and it just, it, at, by the end, you know, it's like, oh, there's always that triumph and it's just wonderful. They get, she gets rid of some stuff, but then there was a garage filled and her den was filled, boxes stacked eight feet high all in the rooms where she didn't let go of everything she should have let go of. But at the very least, she got her family back. You know, that was very, very sweet. And it just occurred to me how often we hoard garbage. We, we not, not physical. Not, I could go to all your houses and know that you're not hoarders, and unless you are, and you're just really good at cleaning it up and, and hiding it when, I, you know, should I ever come over. But, you know, just... We tend to hold on to stuff because hoarding is all evidence of a lack of something in your life. It's a, it's a, it's a loss of control. It's a lack of something. And, and so I want to deal to an extent today with spiritual hoarding as it, as it pertains to this part two of our, of our series, The Simple Life, uh, as we go through the 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 23rd Psalm, it just, it was fitting. I, I in fact, you can, you could look at my notes later. You can see I did not have an introduction. I struggled with an introduction for this one. Uh, and it wasn't until I actually was able to see uh, that episode that it kind of stirred a little something. Because when I see that in the physical, I just wonder how many of us hoard things in the spiritual I'll be honest, sometimes we hoard triumphs that we, that, that we hold on to and, and, oh, that day when I did that and in the spirit it was so good. And sometimes we hold on to the spiritual tragedies, and, and we hold, but we hold on to these things because we think that the more we hold on to, the more it defines us. And, and, and that's, there's a problem there is because the more I fill myself up, with stuff that I'm holding on to, the less room there is for what is absolutely important in my entire life. And so I want you to go on this journey with me as we engage the verse 2 of Psalm 23 
Um, you guys are all familiar with the, with the 23rd Psalm uh, and all of that. But I, w- I want to focus today on verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Now, side note, you don't want to miss next week because next week is uber powerful. The Lord's already been talking to me about it. And I haven't even shared this. So uh, I'm excited about next week. Don't miss verse 3 of uh, next week. But he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Two things that he, the shepherd, that uh, uh, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, as we looked at that last week, there are two things that are in this verse that, that kind of define where his... Uh, a part of his role in my life as a, a sheep. And, and, and so it's two things that he does, but one leads to the other. And, and I'm going to really try and skip uh, and bypass all of the, 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 the stuff that I normally just kind of stand to share. Can I be honest with you? Um, transparently, when it seems like I repeat something... Over and over. It's because I want you to get it. So if you get it the first time I say it. Do you know how you could help me from turning a, a, a 30 to 35, 40 minute sermon into an hour and 10 minutes? Perfect. <laughs> Agreement will make a sermon go by a whole lot faster. <laughs> But I want to share this with you because there are two things that the Lord does here. The Lord, my shepherd, that he does here. One leads to the other. The first one leads to the second one. And we'll dig into it, I promise you. But I want to skip all of this and just tell you, here's the point. Here, here's what I want you to get. If, you're, if you get anything else in this entire message, I want you to get this. The point of verse 2, the point of, of this Hoarding, the spiritual hoarding, and, and the reason that we hoard things so much is because, I'll tell you this, because the point has always been intimacy. Now, I say intimacy and ladies are like, amen. And the men are like, dude. Intimacy, that's not, that's not a good word. Well, listen, the reason it's not a good word is because men think differently when they hear the word intimacy. They go towards physical attraction when they hear intimacy. And so when you are encouraged and challenged to be intimate with God, your immediate response is, is no way, dude. Because the world has messed you up on what intimacy is. And so I'm sharing this and and, and want you to understand the reason that that churches seem to be led by women, the reason it seems like the atmosphere is more regulated and controlled by women who worship is because men have too much world in their mind when it comes to intimacy birthed in worship and they quit worshiping. I know I'm preaching and telling you exactly how you feel. Because we all, we all in, in one way or another struggle with that. But the point of verse 2 has always been intimacy. The point of David being a man after God's own heart has always been intimacy. It wasn't what he did for God. It's who he was with God. Intimacy is the, is the paramount point of this. So I, I need you to understand this. When he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures, you need to understand Intimacy is not a request. Intimacy is a command. Intimacy is the expectation. It's not a begging thing. God does not beg you to be intimate with Him. He commands. If He didn't make you, then intimacy would be an option. But He makes you lie down. I I, I don't know how how many of you, by, by... Raised hand only, had trouble getting your kids going to bed at night. 
How many of you had to go in the room and put them in the bed and then take the blankets and tuck it underneath the mattress so that their body weight will hold themselves into the bed? You made them lie down. You were engaged in the process. There's, there's some people lived it so much their hands are still up right now. So uh, I understand. But he makes me lie down. He commands this level of intimacy with me. See, David used the phrase that he makes. This is not him asking for permission. Rather, it is him spelling out God's intention. This implies that intimacy is not something you make the decision about. But as a sheep, you are obediently called into it. To lie down carries with it a meaning of reclining. In fact, when you look up the phrase, lie down, you can't separate lie and down. It's one phrase. In fact, makes me lie down is all one phrase in the Hebrew. And what it means is to recline. It does mean to rest. It does literally mean to lay down. But it means to Recline, And this is closely related to the meal customs of ancient Israel. You see, seating at meals was arranged by status with places of honor to the right and to the left of the host. Meals were eaten sitting, but primarily reclining. Reclining was the custom uh, that was usually practiced by most at festive meals. And while reclining, one's head rested close to the chest of the adjacent person that you were dining next to. And they would literally call it being in the bosom. So, for, for all intents and purposes, you need to understand. When John talks about all of the disciples saying, ask Jesus who's going to betray him. And John says, he put his head on Jesus' chest. He was literally in the bosom of Jesus. But that place is, supply, it is only for the most intimate relationship. John is the disciple whom Jesus loved. And John begins to testify of himself. I was so close to Jesus, I was in his bosom. And so from that place of being in Jesus' bosom, Jesus could be very open with him about what he was thinking. As well as the same, that, that reciprocal relationship of being able to be very open with Jesus because they were that closely connected. When, when David says he makes me to lie down in green pastures, he causes me, he... he makes me to recline in green pastures. You can, you can look up green pastures and if you want to, and you all know that it, it basically just means a lush field, a place to eat. That's, that's pretty much what it is. There's a deeper meaning, but that's saved for the conclusion. You don't get that one yet. So, but here he is, and he says he makes me to recline in him. He makes me to recline. He, and, and if you get the visual, it's not just that he goes and says, oh, here's green places for you to eat. It's the shepherd also goes in and he sits amongst the sheep. Come on now. And because he sits amongst the sheep, the sheep approach him. Now last week, if you remembered the message, you understand that sheep recognize the voice and the face of their shepherd. Recognize it so well that you can put two faces up next to each other and they will go to the one that they are always familiar with. You can talk to them from two different voices. They will recognize the voice that speaks to them and they will flock to that voice. So the shepherd takes them into a place of green pastures and he sits down in that place and the sheep come to him and they come into his bosom. They're that close to the shepherd. They put their head here with him. He talks to them. He calls them by name. They are able to recognize their very own name. There is such power in that thought 
And so here he is, he makes me to recline. He makes me like a shepherd with his sheep. They come to him and he embraces them and holds them to his bosom in a place of safety, in a place of rest. It is the, uh, uh, see, it is the next and only phase of relationship from which everything else can be released. You know, some of the most memorable photos I have of myself and my kids aren't family photos. They're the ones where I'm laying on the couch. Every, every dad has one of these. You're laying on the couch, and the baby, the baby, has been placed on your chest. And it's there that the baby hears the heartbeat. It's there that the baby breathes with you as you're breathing. And it's in that place of rest. That's, that's what he's talking about. It's that memorable place of, it's like having your child on your chest where you're in a restful position reclining in a place of closeness. You know, the, uh, out of all of my kids, my daughter's the only one who will still put her head on my chest when she's at home. I miss that. But I and and so, uh, but but I I understand that 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 closeness. You can say, without being disgusting, ladies and gentlemen, you can say that my daughter and I have an intimate relationship, because she is comfortable enough to be next to her daddy in such a way that she doesn't have to say a word to me. She doesn't have to tell me she loves me. I know she does, and I don't have to tell her I love her. She knows that I do. I don't have to reaffirm that to her because she will come and sit on the couch next to me. She draws into that relationship with her dad. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the same kind of thing. With the Lord. It's not now he says, "Intimacy, come on." And we think intimacy is this. Sometimes it's this. When in reality it's this. It's not, it's not your level of comfort in worship. It's your absolute transparency in the embrace of the king. And so it's intimacy that he, that he demands of you. It's, it's funny, right? He had, Jesus had 12 disciples... He had the three that were closest to him. But in all of scripture, he only had one that he loved. Now, Peter would die for Jesus. Peter defended Jesus. Peter cut off ears for Jesus. He was one that was used by the Lord on the day of Pentecost. So there's wonderful things. And yet there's only one in scripture who is identified as being in the bosom of Jesus. And it wasn't so that we all revere John. It's so that we all know that we are capable of having that exact same relationship. This is why David, understand, this is why David is so irate when he is confronted by Nathan. This is why, this, why David gets so angry at that story that the prophet Nathan tells him. You know, you, you remember the story. I preached on it a couple of weeks ago where the, the prophet Nathan comes to him and says, there's a man and he has an abundance of sheep and he's got a neighbor that's got one. And the neighbor with the, and the man who has abundance of sheep has a guest that comes over and instead of killing one of his own sheep, he decides to take the one from his neighbor dress it, cook it, and serve it to his friend. And David is not irate because of the theft. He's irate because he understands as a shepherd the closeness the man had with his one and only sheep. That sheep was better than a dog. Dogs are man's best friend, but that sheep had such a relationship. Most of the time, the, 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 it wasn't just that sheep stayed outside. Many times, they were in the house. The shepherd is the gate for the sheep. When he gets them into a pen, a natural pen that's kind of like a rock area, the, the shepherd will lay 
at the front of the opening of those, of, of those places so that the sheep don't cross it. They don't jump over him because they see him as the safeguard. They are close enough with him that even if he were to wake up and go, uh-uh, they go. And so they trust. They have such an absolute trust in the shepherd. And, and, and David looks at this and he says, man, I could only imagine this one sheep and we don't know the name of the sheep. But we know that this sheep was so important. It was the one sheep. It was the sheep that came indoors in the cold. It was the sheep that might have lain in the bed with the family. It was the one that could come to him and he would hold it and caress it and pet it and clean it and talk and love and bless and just constantly have this intimate communication, this relationship with the sheep. And David is not upset that the, that the sheep was stolen. He's upset that the relationship had been severed. And he goes right after, I can't believe this in all of Israel. This man will pay to the, to the ends of his own life. He needs to be strung up and shot, which they didn't have guns then. But you understand, he needs to be dealt with, judged, hang him, cut him up, do something to him. He needs to be punished beyond belief because he severed relationship. You're the man, David. I destroyed someone else's intimacy. It wasn't just that he stole a woman. He stood in the intimacy between a man and his wife, and he destroyed it. Now, now let me ask you this. How many times do you stand between your Lord and someone else, severing their intimacy because of your attitude, because of your words, because of your actions? Listen, intimacy is commanded. It's not requested. It's commanded. So we've got to understand that if you are in that place of intimacy, this is, this is where we go. Intimacy trusts God to take the lead. He makes me lie down in green pastures place of intimacy he now leads me beside still waters the word lead here doesn't just mean to present or go before you but it carries also a meaning of sustain it expresses a consistency in our lives that we can trust that even when it looks bleak provision comes again and again consider that it's not just that he sustains but what he sustains now in this in this passage he sustains water now I'm gonna dig a little deeper than just water but I want you to hear me uh, our bodies are 60 to 70 percent water that's cool that's why a reduction of water in our bodies by 4% can cause dehydration by 15% loss will kill you at the molecular level, water helps to keep every cell in our bodies functioning at the DNA level to the point of what proteins our cells allow in and what they don't. I'm going somewhere, so I need you to hear that. Water acts not just as a, a, a forming to hold you together, but water creates the atmosphere for, the, for that cell to deny something coming into it or to allow something coming into it. Y'all are, come on now, I, I know y'all are seeing this. And so dysfunction in our system creates all kinds of other breakdowns in the structure of our bodies. In other words, you could say that water keeps us together. So essentially, here's what happens. God sustains the supply of everything that we need to function properly. I know this isn't, this isn't lighting your fire because I lost some of you at intimacy. But if he leads me beside still waters, and don't worry, we'll get into the we'll get into that. But he leads me, he sustains me in still waters. 
It, it, the fact that he leads me beside means that I simply have to drink. Don't, don't miss that. I simply have to drink. I don't have to wonder where it's at. I just take a sip because I'm always led by it. I, I'm always sustained by what I need to keep myself together. All I have to do is take a drink. I don't have to work myself up, find a road map, and get back to the place where it's provided. I just need to trust that I'm constantly walking next to it at all times. You see, if we would get to the place of intimacy and trust with God, we wouldn't necessarily walk out into the wilderness on our own and get stuck. We wouldn't blame other people for our wilderness moments. We, we, would, we would no longer even blame the fallenness of our lives for those things. We would walk in a place of truth and trust with the Lord that he is leading me beside. He's leading me in a place where it is continuously provided. Everything that I need. And if I will grab a hold of what he is providing. Ladies and gentlemen, can I just say that like water, if we would just trust that what God plants into us by his spirit, through the blood of Jesus at salvation, by the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the moving and the breathing and the power of the word of God, if we would just begin to embrace the water... You wouldn't have to come to me to ask me to pray for you to keep all of that sin outside away from you. You could do it yourself. Because if you are formed in that place of his provision, you're the one that makes the decision on what comes in and what goes out. And so if we would just grab this, oh, intimacy creates this level of trust that what he is giving me is what I need. And it's constantly right next to me. I just embrace that. Oh, I'm, I'm, and can I, can I just aside, ladies and gentlemen, can I tell you this? Um, don't drink water when you're thirsty. Did you know that thirsty is already a sign that you're dehydrated? You don't drink water when you're thirsty. You drink so that you don't thirst. That means you take it when you don't need it so that it's there when you do. That means that if you stay in a place of saturation, you don't have to have, oh, I'm thirsty. Yeah. Well, you've been starving yourself. And that's your problem. You come in with bitter beer face coming into the church. We can tell who has and hasn't been drinking. You don't have to tell us. We know who's been partaking on the weekday, on the day-to-day -day basis of the presence of God and walking in a place of intimacy. You don't have to tell us that you haven't had intimacy with the Lord in a long time. We can tell because you're shrunk up like a raisin spiritually. So you drink. <laughs> I know, bitter beer. It's the, it's the only commercial that I ever remember with bitterness. It's like, pull your lip over your face. That's just all I remember. Uh, you know, and, 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 but if we would just get into this, it, it's, not a, 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 it's not intended to be a cycle. It's intended to be a trust. Uh, listen, the only reason Israel went around the mountain for 40 years was because they didn't trust intimacy. They chose for themselves the direction they would go. When God said, go into the land, they said, there's giants. We're better off going out trying to circumvent what you're wanting us to do. And he said, fine, you can go there. But you're going to learn the hard way. Okay, well, then we'll go. Well, don't go because I'm not going. No, we're going to go. You're going to get hurt. We're going anyway. They got hurt. You can read Deuteronomy. He says it's your disobedience that led you to wandering. It's your disobedience that led you to wandering. It's your lack of intimacy with the Lord that led you into wandering. It's your, it's your lack of intimacy that led you into a place of hungering and thirsting. Now, I, I, I say that, but I also know that 
Jesus says, but Je Jesus said this in the, in the Beatitudes. He says, blessed are you who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Don't miss that, though. He's not saying that you're in a drought or dehydrated. He's saying you're constantly already taking of it, and you take so much of it that that's what you feed yourself on. That's what you want more and more. You know, you don't get hungry for what you don't feed yourself. I love pizza. The reason I love pizza is because I feed myself pizza. <laughs> so Stacy's always asking, where do you want to go eat? And I'm like, you choose. She goes, I don't care. Really? <laughs> Would you eat pizza with me today? You know I can't stand pizza, but I want pizza. <laughs> or the natural go-to is burgers. Why? Because I will eat a burger every day because I like it. Even if it's not good for me, I'll eat it. But you understand that you are only hungry for what you are already feeding yourself. You will only thirst for what you are already drinking. You, you, can't, you can't build yourself up into hungering and thirsting for righteousness. You're already feeding on it so that you, de you desire it more and more. So Jesus isn't saying you're blessed when you make the decision to start. He's saying you're blessed because you're already. And so if we get to that place of understanding that, okay, he's making me recline, he, he demands, he's commanding intimacy, he's commanding it in my life, it's not a request, he's not begging me, he says, come here, we're going to get close. And then he says, you can trust me because I'm always going to lead you in a place where the supply that you need to keep it together is always there. Take the drink. Take the drink. Oh my goodness. See, he provides all that we need in our lives for peace. What does that mean? It means in turmoil there's peace. It means in triumph there's peace. It means in stress there's peace. It means in every situation peace is made available. The fact that we are led beside it tells we only need to take a drink. Lastly, I'm closing told you I was going to give you the last bit in the closing it's important to visit one other aspect of the words pasture and still so both imply something I've never seen before because when you look in the when you look in the words and, and listen I don't I don't do this loosely to just kind of throw a meaning out there I understand that words in the Greek and in the Hebrew have various meanings and the context of those meanings, uh, of, the, of the place you find those words determines the word you're actually using. I, I get that part. And so for those of you who think I'm just randomly choosing, I'm not. But there is an, Im is, is an implied meaning to the word pasture and the word still. And that is the word abode. In other words, a dwelling place so he makes me recline in intimacy in a lush place for dwelling he leads me beside the dwelling place of everything that I need to stay together it's a dwelling now, here's the cool thing. We can look at it, a dwelling. What, is, what does that mean? An abode for God? It's very easy. In David's day, before he was king, it was a tabernacle. Then it became a temple. And it was wonderful. And then uh, 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 along the, the, the late, or excuse me, the, the early, the late 4th, early 3rd century, uh, there was destruction that happened, and the temple was destroyed in Israel. Oh. We've lost the abode. Oh, and then they're set free and they rebuild the abode and it's wonderful. It's not as good as the first one, but it's wonderful. And then around AD 62, the enemy comes in and destroys it again. And isn't it so interesting that they go from considering this building. It's not a building. It's you. It's you. The Bible says very clearly, you are the temple. 
of God. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Stephen says when he's before he's about to be killed in, in Acts chapter 6, he says this. He says, how be it? God does not dwell in temples made with human hands. He dwells in spirit inside his vessels. You want to know the dwelling place? You are the dwelling place. You're the place where God has chosen to reside. And in that place that God has chosen to reside, you have full privileges. Carte blanche. Walk in. As the presence of God, as the temple of God, walk in and lay your head on his chest. Sit in his lap and be intimate. Take a drink from his supply or a cup from his supply or a gallon or, you know, whatever. I'm not going to say keg because there's too many worldly people in here. We're not going to say that. But you understand what I'm talking about. The abundance, the abundance, the abundance is all ready. right there if you will trust him the doors will come open if you will trust him I can't wait to get to walking through the valley of the shadow of death I can't wait to get to that I can't wait to preparing a table before me in the presence of enemies golly that's gonna be so amazing but ladies and gentlemen if you don't get first and foremost he's a shepherd who provides and protects and in his provision and protection, you will never lack anything that you need. And how do I know that? Because he demands intimacy of me. And he leads me next to the place of continuous supply at all times. So I'm never lacking. And it's not, it's not a hard destination. Because it happened the supply was open to you the supply chain you were given access to the kingdom supply chain the moment you said Jesus is Lord and I believe that God has raised him from the dead and as I walked into salvation the temple became inside of me and the provision became inside of me and the shepherd takes his seat inside of me he is with me everywhere that I go oh I know it's um, it's hard at times to think about it's hard to fathom it, it, it's it's hard to wrap our minds around it. And I know for, for, for men, you know, it's one thing for us to go, men, he wants to lead you beside still waters. And you go, yes. Yes, that's a good thing because I can fish. I can be a man. Can I, can I take a side note for just a second? Can I tell you that the trouble with the church has been that we've told young men what men do not taught them how to be men you want to know why there is such a gender identity struggle in the world today and a lot of Christian young men are struggling with it it's because the church stopped teaching them who a man is I, I, I was a royal ranger but as you can look at me and see, I don't camp. I don't chop wood with an axe. I'm not an outdoorsman type of guy. I'll go if you ensure that there's a hotel waiting for me when the skeeters get bad. I don't bathe in the creek. I don't do any of those things. I, I love being with my friends. I love learning to tie a rope and I love learning how to start a fire. That was fun because, you know fun okay but you know I, I love to do those things but when it came to camping it was like please don't send me I cannot go outside now I went outside had an imagination played in the neighborhood did all of those things but don't take me camping and put me outside to sleep on the dirt no I'm not doing it but listen but that's what we taught a real man is a real man goes outside and camps, and hunts, and fishes, and this is what he does. And then you get the young men who like 
the arts. Oh, those aren't real men. Well, those, 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 okay, thank you, but go out there and play some football and rub some dirt in your injuries. <laughs> Be a man. And they go, but, but I am a man. I just happen to like things differently. And I know that's, I, I know, listen, I know that's uncomfortable, but ladies and gentlemen, it's our fault. We have young men who are struggling with identity because they're artsy as opposed to outdoorsy. And so we've created a second level of manhood. We call it beta. Beta males. We have alpha males and we have beta males. Alpha males rule everything. They're the guys who are hawking and spitting and doing and, and, and they're, they're the men's men. But the betas, they're the ones that are, have the artistic flair. And, you know, they're kind of like in between woman and, well, we can't really identify what a beta male is. Now, I'm being real with you. Because what, and we have consistently gotten into this because men are not emotional. I'm glad you are. <laughs> men are not emotional. You don't cry. You don't ever show brokenness. Unless it's sin. Then you can talk about being broken. But you never show brokenness as a man. You, you don't do that. Men don't do that. And so we have men who won't worship because we're afraid that that tickle of emotion will come into our lives and we'll go, the more I think of you, the more I really want to cry because of what you've done for me. But I can't do it, so I'm not going to. Guilty, ladies and gentlemen. Can I... Uh, you're going to learn a lot about me. I had a, a baby sister who lived 13 hours. 13 hours. I saw her in the hospital, struggling to breathe. Nothing. Laid her to rest. Nothing. For weeks, nothing. Why? Why? Why, why won't you cry? Because I'm a man. And men don't cry. Men hold it in. They handle life. They deal with it. They wear it on their shoulders. They bear it everywhere that they go. Men, men, the strongest men we look at are the men who are able to carry large weights. Forgetting that Jesus said, cast it all onto me. A real man doesn't have to carry weight because his king has carried it for him. A real man gets into a place, and, and listen, I'm talking to myself because that's one thing that I, if I'm being honest, struggle with. I struggle with emotion. I've been here 20 years, and you all know this by now. If you haven't figured it out, I struggle with emotion. You know why? Because intimacy is just not the right word. Pals, gotcha. Friends, buds, yes. Intimate relationship is for women. No, it's not. David was ignorant. He was dumb. He might have been kingly and he might have killed some giants, but he was stupid. You know why? Because he forgot intimacy, even though he's the author of it. He forgot it. Turned into something else. Lost his mind and did some things. Severed the intimacy of someone else. Ladies and gentlemen, I got to tell you, I'm tired of being one who severs intimacy for people. By telling them, you got to quit. Too much? Is it, was it too much? I, 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 I want you to hear that. 
Intimacy is what we've been called to. We're commanded to. Now I know that that does that means that some of that that listen for today the win is just stepping out of your comfort zone. That's it. The win is making a step. For men, it's making a step. For women, it's also making the same step. But ladies and gentlemen, we've been called to a place of intimacy. We've been, we've been called to a place, because there's, there's nothing like women who worship, but there are battles that are won when men do it. When women worship, there's battles that are won too, but when men do it, the enemy all of a sudden realizes just how serious people are. And when I'm talking about this whole abode, this, this place of living, and I, I got to stop because I don't want to keep carrying on. But understand, it, it begins in a place of worship. It begins and ends in a lifestyle of worship where we're okay with loving God. Loving Him. Worshiping Him. And so, it's my response to His command for intimacy that builds the abode of supply in my lives in our lives. I want to respond today. Stand with me. I want you to respond.